there's a black Ferrari parked outside in the fire lane, and the school wants you to move it. License plate is number two, PAC number four, LYF. If this is your car. Please, please remove it. Um, so we're super happy to have Felipe here today from BlazingDB. Uh, BlazingDB is the only database system based out of Peru, right? So Felipe and his brother started BlazingDB in 2015. Most of the development is done in Peru, but they have uh, they have an office in in Texas where because he went to UT Austin for his undergrad. Okay, all right, go for it. Thanks, man. Great. Um, so hey, I'm I'm Felipe. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today. Um, the very small amount about the company and Blazing DB, but the mostly what I'd like to do is once I give you a quick introduction to what we've been building for a little while. Um, I want to get questions from you guys about. What makes it fast? What's slow? What works? What doesn't work? What, uh, however, I can, you know, help increase the knowledge that you may or may not have about GPU accelerated databases. So that's that, that's really my intention here today. So please stop me, ask questions, like you know, yell it out. I, I will not get offended. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about a little bit is Rapids AI. So Rapids AI is. Uh, it's an open source ecosystem that's been built by NVIDIA, um, us, Anaconda, I think Gunrock, Scikit-Learn, and I'm forgetting somewhat, Quonsite. Um, but what we've, what we've all basically done is that we've taken Arrow. Do you guys all know Arrow? Does anyone not know what Arrow is? Raise your hand if you don't know what Arrow is. Great, Arrow is a, re it's basically, it's a representation of, of, of columnar information, and because it, it, it is it, it's a representation that has been defined and that has certain primitives on it, we can all share the same data representation, right? So what makes Arrow uh, appealing to people is the idea that uh, it doesn't matter if it's in your process or it's in my process, we have the exact same data representation. We can build primitives together, we can share those, we can ferry the data over each other via IPC, and there's no serialization deserialization. I uh, hope I don't have to explain why that is probably a good idea unless someone is opposed. In memory parquet. In memory parquet without the compression. Yeah. And so on top of it, so this rapid AI ecosystem is basically an implementation of Apache Arrow in GPU with a bunch of computational primitives built on top of it. Um, there's deep learning, visualization, machine learning, there's graph analytics. And we are uh, over here in the normal analytics ETL type space. So um, this is a part of CUDF. We'll call it CUDF for the rest of the talk. CUDA data frame is, um, is, is basically the, the primitives built uh, on top of Apache Arrow um, for processing, right? So think of things like scatter, join, zor, and what have you, right? It's, 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 it's ways of operating on these data representations using these primitives. And so what, uh, what we're doing, uh, it, it, one of the things that we've been able to show with this, and so th these are the speeds um, um, of, of execution of a mortgage pipeline. That doesn't mean anything. Basically, you have a bunch of information about California, about who's paying or not paying their mortgages and, and the, the rates of, of delinquency and whatnot. And they were, uh, we were doing um, a, a great deal of machine learning training um, on top of this. This is a project, this is a, a thing that NVIDIA itself was working on. So we, these numbers are made by them, not by us. But um, what we see here is that um, this is how fast we were able to do this um, using um, Spark. This is a, a 20 CPU node Spark cluster. Um, you see what happens when we go to 30, when we go to 50, when we go to 100. Right here, we're using five times the number of resources, but we're definitely not getting to 5x improvement. And over here, we're showing the exact same workflow using very similar code. So it's all written in Python at this point, the, the interface that the user use, but we had like a 4,000x performance improvement. Um, and and this, uh, this is really what, what, what kind of, you know, it made us get excited about Rapid. Well, actually, this happened after, but, but th this is what we're trying to do with Rapids, right? We're trying to show you that um, the CPU, you can't just throw more money at it. And you all know this because you're in a GPU class. But um, the GPU rocks for these kinds of operations. And, uh, 
And so working in a nice open source ecosystem like Rapids uh, that works on the GPU was uh, something that would be very beneficial for us. So what we ended up doing is we built Blazing SQL, which is a group of different tools that are operating on top of this Rapids AOI ecosystem. And before we could even get to the Blazing SQL part, we had to build a lot of the computational primitives in uh, what used to be called libgdf and is now called qdf. So the first thing I kind of want to show you guys is, eh, we'll talk about that later, um, is what Arrow on GPU is, right? It's, it's, it's a very simple struct, and then obviously because you're smart, you will abstract this with a nice C++ API like we did, and you'll do all kinds of exciting stuff with it. But um, the, the, the basic gist of it is you've got two pointers to, to information that resides in GPU. It's just your, your data, and this is a validity bit mask, right? You know, one for I am a valid value, zero for I am not an invalid value. And then the very similar kinds of information that you would see in Arrow metadata, right? Um, the size is a, the number of rows, the type of column that we're looking at here, a null count, which kind of lets you know the way you need to look at this valid thing. And, um, and this uh, stuff over here is junk. It's stuff that some other people use, but we don't. <laughs> um, and so you end up with things like this. So we make, we have lots and lots of primitives that are basic like this. The inputs are columns and you know, a few other things, and your outputs are always columns, right? So you're, um, everyone that, that, that is operating in libgdf in general is using primitives that are like this. We're all using columnar primitives and we're all interacting together. So the, the, the idea that we were trying to solve here is ETLing information for, uh, for all these different, you know, that for QDNN, which is neural networks in CUDA, QGraph, a graph library, uh, or QML. So we're, we were trying to make it so that you could take information from the data lake, and we'll get to that in a bit, bring it into Arrow GPU memory, and make that available to all these other libraries. Does that make sense, that that is what we were interested in solving? Yes, no, questions so far? Okay, all right. Um, okay, so real quick, I'm gonna show you uh, a little bit about how it would be used. And uh, after I kind of go into how it would be used, I'd really like to get some questions about what, uh, why this could or could not work, a little bit of doubt. Um, but uh, users interact with SQL. Um, all, uh, sorry, users interact with SQL via Python connector. Um, most of these APIs here are from PyGDF, which is the Python version of this QDF thing that I've been talking about. Um, you do things like read parquet files here. We're skipping out a bunch of stuff like telling you which columns and what row groups and all that just for showing you something quickly. But you basically load parquet files into GDF columns. You open up connections and you start running queries on them. Right? This, is, this is actually one of three ways that you can get data into libgdf. Uh, into QDF. Um, all user interactions for us go through an orchestrator. The orchestrator's only job is to interact with the rest of the cluster. It is the entry point for users. And what the orchestrator, uh, the, the first thing the orchestrator interacts with when you're running SQL, for example, is our parser and planner, which uses Calcite. Who here has used Calcite? Who here has heard of Calcite? Okay, all right. who here likes or dislikes? Who dislikes Calcite? Because you've heard of it, but nobody's used it. We don't know yet. Don't know yet, all right. Well, I um, like it a bit, you know, like sl slightly more than halfway. You know, I don't dislike it for sure. Um, but Calcite lets you do, you know, as you all know, a couple of nice things that before we used to manage ourselves that were just a pain in the ass. So parsing and validating queries is, is a nightmarish work, and it is not very interesting, I think, normally from the aspect of developing a database. So I encourage everyone to, uh, to look for tools to help you do the, the, the regex and the string, because it's not very exciting stuff, right? You know, I disagree, but keep going. Sorry. Um, some people find it very exciting, parsing. Um, I don't know about parsing. Oh, validating. Yeah, that's good. OK, all right, all right. So yeah, um, OK. I, as a person trying to sell something, yes. 
in all honesty, was not so interested in the parser. And so that is kind of why we, we decided to use calcite. So calcite, basically what it does is it, it, it takes something like this. Here's an example of a very simple query. Uh, so I can x, x plus y from a table and doing a join with another table. And what it ends up giving me is, is this right here. And here we have a non-optimized query plan, right? I'm going to scan table A and table B so that I have them both available. I'm going to do a logical join, right? Then I'm going to do my filter, right? I'm saying that the first column, which is x in this case, is less than 5. And then I'm doing some projections, right? The getting the column x and then adding x plus y. And what, what kind of, what, what, what sucks here? What, 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 what is interesting about um, the order of these operations? Filter after join. Filtering out, yeah, because we're, we're, we're moving up, right? The nesting is. What, what, what should we do with that? Switch. switch it. Yes, we should switch it. Now, obviously, this is like a very simple example. It's very easy to know how to do, but that, that is one of the things that Calcite can help you do, right? It, it, it can push this filter condition down. Um, ideally, we're not, I didn't put the optimizer here, right? Ideally, it would also be pushing these projections down because after you scan the table, you don't actually want to load all of the columns in the table when you have a column in the data set, but that's right, yeah. Um, the, 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 the predicate push down um, and, and being able to even replace certain relational algebra nodes, right? So something like, a logical join followed by a filter could become something else, right? You, you, you could do something where I have a special kind of scan that actually knows how to do uh, predicate push down on metadata, right? So you could make, you, you, you could make new operators that, that, that do a lot more exciting things and build that into Calcite. You can build your own rules. Um, you, you, you can make it so that your, your algorithm can basically replace parts of this subtree with what you consider to be equivalent, equivalent more, more efficient interpretations. Any questions about calcite? Why we picked it? Why it might be a bad idea? Why did you pick it? We picked calcite because it was um, open source and free. Uh, was uh, one of the big impetuses. So is Orca. So is Orca. Yeah, um, I never heard of Orca. I mean, all honesty. <laughs> okay. The green, the green plum uses Orca. Okay. All right. All right. Um, so yeah, I had never heard of it, um, and. Why did we? No, and it's a good question because I'm actually thinking about it. Like, what is, So we picked it in part. It felt like there's nothing else. The, than Orca. If you don't know Orca, then this is the only one you know about. Yeah, this is the only one I knew about, and it it uh, it was actually very fast to get up and started. So you can you you can do the 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 parser, planner, validator. You can go from going to a query to a relational algebra plan in hours, and. Um, and through not too much effort, a few weeks, you know, you can make that persistent and build your own rules and do, do some nice optimizations on top of that. But it's just the barrier to entry was low, low, low. And we, at that point, weren't thinking, oh, it's in Java. And because normally we don't like Java. Not, not that we don't like the language. We're just, we're usually writing in C, right? We're usually, and we're usually writing in C because we have very tight loops that we're running in, right? Where this is a columnar database. Um, but it, uh, it was easy to use, didn't take a lot of time to get up and running, and uh, lets you forget about all this nonsense, which was a very big problem for us the first time around, where I said you could never make a database unless you also build the parser and planner, because that's what it does. Um, and well, that's only partly true. <laughs> So, have you hit any limitations with calcite so far? It hasn't been stressed enough. Uh, in all honesty, it has not been stressed enough. Um, but because of the way it works and the fact that it's interchanging very small amounts of information, I mean, you, there's ways to scale that up. There, that, that's not. I'm never worried about calcite being the bottleneck in the workflows that I'm looking at. Oh, it's not, I mean, not the bottleneck, but the oh. quality of the query plans. Oh, yes, but uh, the way that so. <laughs> In, in the end, uh, we're going to try to, we're building our own physical planner that's going to take Calcite's logical plan and implement that as opposed to using it for the physical plan. The reason that we're doing that is because we're, we're, we're trying to, to interact with uh, some columnar primitives that I'm not going to talk too much about right now just because it's, it's still very early days, but we, we had not planned on using it for the physical plan yet. Any questions about that? Because that's kind of crazy. Yeah, 
because it sounds like a bad idea. It does sound like a bad idea. Um, so would you think that it'd be smarter to try to build that representation in Calcite and, and, and have that be something that exists within Calcite? Like, do we, should we teach it to build directed graph relational plan, uh, logical, uh, physical plans when it doesn't really have that capacity? I, I, I don't know enough about Calcite. I'm, just, I'm thinking of things like, um, like if you want to do like uh, a nesting of, of, of nested queries and things like that, sort of subqueries and shit like that. I don't know. I, I don't know how that that would value up or whether you can do that purely in a logical plan. A nested query? Nested queries. Of course, you can do a nested query in a logical plan. Huh. I mean, no, 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 yeah, oh, that's a good example. Or at least Calcite does it, but yeah, yeah, all right, that's a better example. All right, keep going. I'll think about it. So I'm wondering when you say you are not using a physical plan, what do you exactly mean? So we we will translate the logical plan to physical plans, and then which plan you will choose would affect the cost of that plan. Right? Right. So you get so you can get an optimized logical plan like this, right? Right, but then when you don't know what the physical plan is, how do you accurately estimate the cost of that plan? Or you pass that in? Great question. You don't estimate it when you've been working on it for nine and a half months like we have. So this new version does not do that. We're not, it's not a cost-based estimator. Oh, it is a rule-based estimator. I see, I see, I see. Right. Sorry. Um, but yeah, um, it'll be. Um, we're satisfied right now because in all honesty, um, if, you're, if you're working on the CPU, this matters so damn much to you, right? I have 700 gigabytes per second of bandwidth to my memory. Um, I'm a little bit less worried about making the most, most efficient uh, physical plan. I'm a lot more concerned about worrying about my I.O. I'm a lot more concerned about um, getting out of like cache, having to jump to system memory, having to jump to disk. Um, this, this is just not... In, in, in a GPU context, th this is normally not where you're being cut off at the knees, if that makes sense. It's not what's slowing you down. Questions about that? Bold it is a bold statement. I'm expecting some incredulity. How the, many, what's the largest like, joint query do you guys support? Um, in, in Blazing SQL or before? Whatever's going through Calcite. Uh, the largest query we've run in Calcite. In terms of number of tables you're joining. I want to say five. That's why. That and that okay. All right. So yeah. So the kinds of joins and work that that we're doing for machine learning, we're not doing a lot of like star schema, build this enormous, like I'm going to take a million tables, or I have a table for like different kinds of. Uh, uh, you know, like I, I, I got a flag over here, and that maps to dimension tables. dimension tables. That's the word I was looking for. So we're we're not doing these kinds of workloads yet. It's 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 not been our focus. Um, I'm sure that as this gets used more and more, someone's going to try something like that. And they're going to say, "Hey, your thing fucking sucks. It's super slow," and and we're going to have to make it uh, better. Um, and I, as I've been telling you, right, we've been working in the database space for for about. Four and a half years and three and a half years is blazing. Um, this is something very new for us. And the vast majority of the effort that has gone into, into blazing SQL is work on rapid AI. It's in this open source columnar primitive library, which we've kind of used to build this on top. Any other questions about parsing and planning? What, we're, we're not the, uh, <laughs> the best anyways. So then we, we, we get to the way that a, a worker node works, right? So we've got the Apache Arrow GPU memory representation, right? It's the same representation that, like we said, all the machine learning, all the, uh, all the, all the rapid AI ecosystem projects are all using this same thing. So you can actually shuttle this information around during execution, after execution, before you can receive inputs. You can run queries on information that is output from machine learning library because we're all speaking the exact same language. Oh, and a very important thing is that whenever we're on the same nodes, we're, they, we're using zero copy IPC, right? So there, there's, no, there's no copy. I don't copy information to the machine learning library that wants to consume it. I, I, I consume it directly 
as I, I, you, you basically give the consuming process access to that region of memory. So you, you can write to it, you can read from it, you can't free it, obviously, but um, it, it, it greatly reduces the, the, the need to kind of be moving information around. You guys do a lot of IPC? Is that, is that something you guys are excited about? Gets you going? Doesn't? Not really. Not really. Not really. What, what do you guys do? You copy it all around, move it around, dump it a disk? What's? Same, same process. Same process. All right. Um, I don't know what Gabe does. No, I was going to say, some of us like IPC. Some of us like RPC. OK. You gotta do it. You gotta do it. It's just like it's not. It's not. It's not the most big. It's not the biggest concern for you guys. Or I have other problems. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. Um, so in this, the, this uh, the worker has a relational algebra. In, it, 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 it takes the logical plan, interprets it, and basically converts it to libgdf primitives. Right. So it'll um, like if you're doing something like. Uh, I'm filtering, uh, well, no, that filtering is boring. Let's do, let's do, I don't know, okay, I'm doing a, uh, an, an, an aggregation, right? So it, it is what will, ha if, you're, if you've got, for example, multiple columns that you're aggregating on and you're interested in hashing that information to do, to do, to put it into faster buckets, but it is the code that will generate the hash. It's the code that makes a, we use um, two different, ver there's a sort based and a hash based, but if you're using like the hash base, it's what builds the map for you. It's what knows how to probe the map. So the, these are all um, columnar operations that happen within QDF. It's not in RAL, it is, there are primitives that exist here. And the really nice things is that um, these primitives are shared by all the members in the ecosystem. So we're all working to make them faster. Um, that's, that, that's the basic anatomy of what this does. The, the, the only thing the RAL does is it takes the plan that came out of here and it, 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 it converts that to libgdf primitives and has a mathematical expression parsing for, for converting you know, mathematical expressions to binary operators. We'll see. Yes, so binary operators are all code gen. They're just in time compiled. Um, uh, no, no, uh, to PTX assembly. Um, it's, uh, so there's, okay, that's an interesting question because there's actually four versions of this, right? So one that was originally made, which is basically, I'm going to take all my operations and I'm going to template this and I'm going to make a binary that is enormous because you've got, 14 different data types and, and, and how many operations it grows. It, it takes two hours to compile. Um, the next iteration of this was uh, using this thing called Jitify, which is uh, it, it takes uh, C++, compiles it in the moment, and, um, and gives you uh, a CUDA kernel that you can basically run, some, some, some the machine instructions that you can that you can run just like you would any other kernel. Uh, the problem with that one is it takes like 100 milliseconds to compile these things for the first time. Once it's in the cache, it's okay, but that's, it's, it's slow. Um, and uh, then there's one that's uh, being worked on. It's a joint collaboration between NVIDIA and us that is the same thing, but based on PTX assembly. And then there is my favorite, which I'm trying to push, which is, and th this one will be very controversial, is I actually believe in making an interpreter that takes in. Uh, woo. Okay, I'm uh, I'm more interested in making an interpreter that. Oh yeah, I'll let you do the thing, um, wherein you would you would make a kernel whose purpose is um, to to limit the amount of I/O. Right. So my, my biggest interest here is. Um, when you're reading from global memory, you're limited to 600, 760 gigabytes per second, which is slower than obviously what you get in each core. So um, do you guys know about coalesced memory access? Great, that, that's a concept. Do I need to go over that at all? Anyone? Might as well just do it. Might as well just do it. All right, so uh, when you're, can, is this usable? It's but it's not in the video, I won't use it. Yeah, so basically in, in, when you're interacting with the GPU, whenever you make a request from global memory, 
a, a, making a, a, a very a small request has the exact same overhead of making a much larger request. This is a concept that you're yet you're very aware of, right? Um, the, but another very important part of this request is that the alignment, so the, if I have, let's say, a GPU with 10 threads, which doesn't exist, but let's pretend like we have 10 threads, having that information so that the distance between uh, the information that you're reading on the first thread and the second thread is the same as the information that you're reading on the second thread and third thread, gives you orders of magnitude more performance improvement for, for getting information onto and off of your GPU. So um, because uh, that is what a person like me thinks is, is the most important part to manage, uh, the, the solution that I, the, the last potential binary operators right now, we're using the JIT one, but that, that could be implemented is one where you, let's say you've got four columns and you're trying to do like A plus B divided by X times Y. But I'm, let's just do A plus B, actually. A plus B divided by Y. Um, you can either do something where you do A plus B, materialize that, and then divide it by Y, um, which, you know, it's, it's going to force you to be dumping to global memory. You're going to be, you're going to be writing and reading from it twice. Or you can set up a situation where you read all of these columns in a coalesced fashion into a buffer, right? So let's say I've got, you know, two the, the two ints and the last int that I'm trying to divide it by. I read it into local memory once, so the, and then never and you never materialize a plus b divided by y. You instead interpret that expression and do all those transformations locally. And the only thing you end up dumping back out to global memory is the final output of the interpretation. So what this allows you to do, do you have a question? Why is, that, why is that something a compiler cannot do? It is something a compiler probably could do, I'm sure, but it's not something that the NVIDIA compiler does right now. Um, also, it's, in the GPU, it's very different. Um, because obviously if they could do it, they would be doing it, but the, the synchronization mechanisms that you have there are um, a, a little bit more complicated, right? You, you've got 4,000 threads that could or could not be stepping on each other, and the compiler doesn't necessarily know what you're going to be doing with it, right? Aren't they just doing static partitions most of the time? I don't even know what that means. What? Static partitions most of the time. Is who doing that? I, again, I don't understand the expression. Static partitioning? Yeah. Is this a compiler thing? No, it's just that, like, to avoid them stepping on each other, they basically just say, oh, they don't actually share the registers anymore. So that's, okay, yeah, that's not exactly how a GPU works, right? So you've got, so each, each thread has its own registers, right? Yeah. And, and, um, and, but, each thread could only be running one instruction at a time. So if, if you've got like, like you know how an SM works, right? So you've got a bunch of different cores on the same on the on, on the same basically like little mini processor. They all have to execute the exact same instruction. It's not like you can have some managing the oh I'm not stepping on you or like that. Yeah, so what exactly is the synchronization challenge you were referring to? So. For us, it's not that there is one, but I'm saying the compiler can't just abstract that away. So it does not know how, so if you're doing binary operators from like A plus B divided by Y, there's no issue there, right? It's fine because there's, there's no shared memory that we're synchronizing. There's nothing happening like across the warps. It's just um, the compiler doesn't know that. And I am not smart enough to tell the compiler how to know that. Compilers don't work unless proven otherwise. That's the rule. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the very last thing that I'm going to mention before I'm hoping to get uh, some more questions is, um, so th this I mentioned to you all before. Uh, we interact with threads of the Rapid ecosystem through the QDF, and all all the movement of data between this and that happens via zero IPC. And a, a, an interesting aspect of this is that 
when you run a query on the engine, the, the relational algebra interpreter is not, it's not going to return the response over to here and back to the user. Um, and, and the reason for that is that every worker is going to keep a, a subset of this uh, result set. Right? So if you've got four nodes in your cluster, each one of your nodes is going to have a small part of that result set in it. And the idea behind this is that we can then use a tool like we're using Dask. Uh, you guys ever heard of Dask? No. no. Dask is basically a task scheduler for Python. And it's integrated well with the Rapids AI ecosystem so that you can do things like schedule machine learning jobs, XG boost. And, um, and because all these processes are also running in this distributed context, and Dask is aware of how a distributed GDF works. So our representation, because it's part of the same ecosystem, is the same as what Dask uses. You can run queries and have those outputs go directly into your machine learning libraries without having to do uh, any, any copy, right? That's the zero copy IPC. And that, that in a gist, is what, what the blazing SQL is uh, right now in, in, in its first iteration, uh, except for <laughs> I.O., which I, I kind of glossed over. But the, like before I start going into this, does any of this make sense? Where is it? Like, like, does it suck? Does if you want, but if, if you're, I'm going to determine I want my, my query result. I, I'm using Tableau. Yep. And I want to run your thing. You can't have it dump the output. You can. So, the way that it works is that when you run a query, you, the, the, the RHEL has a result, the, this node has a result set repository, right? It has a place where result sets are stored and they have a token associated with them. Whoever wants to retrieve that token can, and they can retrieve it right now over zero copy IPC T and uh, TCP, and we're, we're working on UCX, but that's a little bit further down the line. Um, but the idea is that you, you want to make sure that the person consuming your result set is not necessarily the originator of the query. It, it, it can be somebody else. And th this was important for us so that we could do this, right? So that, so that these people can request those result sets when they want them and expect them. Very Hadoop-esque. Very Hadoop-esque, yes. Yes. What, uh, what are some alternatives that we could do? I mean, again, the standard way is like I, over GDBC, UDBC, I ask for a query, and you send me that result. That's a standard way of doing this. That's a standard way. Yeah, that so I guess I don't see any downside to, to doing it this way because you can replicate JDBC-like functionality by just, get my result, I'm done. But uh, the, other, the other thing, if you start benchmarking against other systems that do always send the result back, you have to account for that. The coalescing results in different nodes and putting it, put it together. Yes, OK. And one of the, one of the big ideas here is that we're not going to be doing a lot of that coalescing. We're not expecting to. We're not looking for those kinds of workflows at the moment. Um, in fact, if somebody else wanted to do that, that would be like great. Like if you wanted to do something like take a really big distributed result set and merge it in system memory somewhere, that, that, that would be something we might consider later on down the road. But right now, the, our idea, at least for now, is we're trying to get as fast as possible to these guys because People have spent a lot of money and time on this, and everyone kind of ignored the less sexy part of machine learning, which is, oh, shit, you need information to, uh, to do machine learning. Questions? Yes. Uh, so uh, the code you showed, I assume, is a loading uh, table into a single node. How do you do the series that I know? That's what I'm about to do. So that, that, that first one. So that, um, that is one way of loading data into a GDF, right? The user can do it in the Python. Another way that this is possible is that there's an API that receives file handles, right? And, and the file handles are, it, it's not just like a file path, right? The, these handles can tell you, I'm on, S, I'm on this S3, I'm on HDFS over here, and we have this, uh, we have our I.O. library, which you can register file systems for into it so you can say something uh, so it, it basically makes an HDFS uh, like a, a Hadoop file system available to your whole cluster or an S3 available to your whole cluster an Azure file storage available to your whole cluster and then um, 
the the when the u the user would instead of submitting right the 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 the, the actual data submits the file handles here go to the orchestrator and the orchestrator's job is to, it has capacities for pushing data skipping computation over here to the RAL, coming back and then dividing up that problem, right? So you can, you, 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 you partition the files, the row groups, the columns here, and then the, the, the each relational algebra interpreter uses blazing IO to pull information from that source, right? So it's, so each of the workers and ends up doing their own I.O. Um, and I mean, that, that, that's self-explanatory. Why do you want to do that, right? You, you don't, the, the first use case I showed you was for the, uh, we were giving this talk at, 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 a, at a conference that was a lot more marketing type speak and you want to show them, hey guys, look at how fast it is to connect to PyGDF. And while you can do that, that's obviously not the most intelligent way. Definitely not as smart as, as using something which can connect your data lake, and interact with Parquet, ORC, and CSV are the file formats that are handled right now, and hopefully more, more are coming. I know that they're working on one that's, uh, we, and you could also use Arrow, of course, just Arrow. And uh, Avro, someone's working on Avro, I think that was Quonsite. Um, but yeah, does that make sense? Doing all the I.O. here, interacting with the data lake. Um, and, I guess the last step that, um, and th this is something that has actually been pretty exciting for us because we've been working on this problem for a while, is a distributed cache so that uh, the data lake, while enormous and great and you can put everything you want to it, it's still slow, right? So if every time I'm trying to, to launch a big query, I'm having to hit that data lake, uh, you're, you're, you're going to run into a lot of, of problems. Um, so what, what we do actually is, is, is that um, the, the, the orchestrator is aware of what, what I.O. has been done in all these different places so that you can, you can actually pull, if, if you know, for example, that worker three has, uh, has pulled a certain amount of information from the data lake recently, worker two can get its information directly from worker three, and it's, it's up to the orchestrator to maintain those mappings. And obviously, if worker two goes to worker three and asks it from cache, and it's like, oh no, this isn't in my cache, it still just falls back to the data lake. That part makes sense. All right, questions. So that, that this is kind of in a nutshell, like the thing that, that, that we've been building, you know, uh, well, a lot of these things are things we've been building for a long time, um, but this, this relational algebra interpreter and the, the parser and planning and, and getting involved with rapid AI is something we've been doing for a little bit over nine months, maybe. Uh, clarification question, are those dotted line boxes each a process? Oh, down here? This is just the idea you got multiple workers. Yeah, but like, what are they? Oh, so these are nodes. Uh, this is a node, this is the user, the, I mean, this could be here too, but this is, this is your user, right? This is a coordinating node, these are worker nodes, and this is a misnomer because these are actually in here. So the question I'll ask is the same question I've asked everyone else, and I don't, don't have an answer yet, is, I mean, what is the performance benefit you're getting from being in the GPU versus the CPU? It depends on what you're trying to do, right? But um, so in the in the, the the mortgage pipeline, which is trying to figure out, it, it basically in the end, the output of the mortgage pipeline was uh, a, a model which can tell you how likely you are to be someone that defaults in the state of California on your mortgage. But um, that performance improvement was four thousand x. Well, smart doesn't count. Uh, Okay, so Spark doesn't like count is, is a way to say it. Uh, uh, optimized database, uh, you know, Andy can make the most optimized ones, I, I guess. Uh, but I mean, like, uh, for your, for that particular example, the mortgage stuff, mm -hmm. how much of that is like in Rapids? Because that's not your code, right? Rapids is not your code. Well, yeah, no, so Rapids is not our closed source code. Rapids is the open source project that we contribute to. But I'm saying, you're not, you're not building, you didn't write the DNN library. No, we, ran, we wrote the QDF library. Which is in Rapids. Okay. So we're saying like, like the, for the part that is Blazing SQL. Oh yeah. Before you hand it off to Rapids, like what performance benefit are you getting from the GPU? 
so the the graphic is so this is uh sorry this right here is data loading this is data conversion right so this is etl okay so the 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 vast majority of the time is etl here and uh, yeah so so blade sql is a on gpu etl yes okay yes so you the wow yeah very good yeah, I like that. I, I'm going to say that from now on. Yes, we are an on-GPU SQL ETL engine. Yeah. That is a much more succinct way uh, than I say it. It's my job. Yeah, yeah. no, but that, that, that's really all we're trying to do. We're trying to ETL information from files into machine learning. Which makes it sound a little bit less exciting, but there's a lot of fun things going on there. <laughs> And what is the data conversion you're doing here? Like it's taking a text file. So here, the, um, this right here was actually converting it to the, the, the GPU, like the, the format that XGBoost was expecting. Okay. So, uh, Parquet. What is Parquet's input format like? What is Parquet's input format? Binary compressed columns. Binary compressed columns split up into a bunch of small chunks, right? And what is the normal path that decompression? That XGBoost? Takes? So now it actually takes um, arrow on GPU. No, no. But we're comparing it to CPU. Like, so in... Yeah. Th this was not... Th so they, they... I'm not... So I was involved in, in this part more. What what did they output to? It's it's I'm pretty sure it's just buffers of like int 16 and stuff like that. Like you pass XG yeah, boost takes buffers. The way that I would rephrase Andy's question. Yes. You've put a lot of work into doing your GPU optimized stuff. Yes. If someone else came along and put an equivalent amount of work into optimizing the CPU side of that data conversion, mm -hmm. what are these numbers going to that's a good question. I'm not certain, but whatever they're going to look like, you're still going to have to move it from the CPU to the GPU and manage that process, manage that I.O. Right? So that, that's significant, right? Um, if you're... For the yeah, of course. Right? You, you have to move it to the GPU. And moving to the GPU can be not so expensive if you're using pinned memory, but then you need it, like, if you start using too much pinned memory, though, then your, the rest of your system degrades. So there, there's, you know, there's always that, that you're going to have to transfer it to the GPU bottleneck when you do do it on the CPU. So whereas uh, in our pipeline, right, the only thing that comes in is compressed representations into the GPU, gets decompressed on the GPU, you do all your transformations, ETLing, select, whatever, where, and then it goes here. But, so... You made a good point. This, and let, 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 me, let, me, let me clarify this. This is a marketing slide. Its intention is definitely to show, holy shit, it went from this to that. Um, I will endeavor to answer that question more appropriately so that when someone says, okay, what's it really doing? I can tell them. Um, yeah, I don't have a good answer for you. But Sorry. The question's not really about you, right? The question is understanding the GPU as a device for manipulation of data as opposed to... Okay. But I think what he, they're doing makes sense because... Well, they're saving PCI bandwidth. What's that? They're saving PCI bandwidth by moving it in the compressed domain to the device. Oh, so yeah. Saying, like, you have to do this, you have to put it to the form the GPU wants, the, 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 the deep net libraries want anyway. Right? So rather than doing the transformation in CPU, you just do it on the GPU. Sure, like I said, you're saving PCI bandwidth. Sure, yeah. And... You're saving PCI bandwidth. You're also able to do it faster, right? So the th okay. So do you have 760 gigabytes per second of bandwidth to your system memory? Do you actually decompress at 760 gigabytes? No, but you get so. <laughs> but I mean, so do are you are you doing this decompression at you know at at system memory speed or at a subset uh, like? Like your, your memory speed is gonna matter, right? And we have decompressed at 200 gigabytes per second on the GPU. And I don't know very many CPU solutions that can do that. I, um, 
I also, I mean, at sorting on the GPU, right? Something as simple as sorting is orders of magnitude faster. So it's, it's a couple of things, right? One, it's the cores, just the number of cores that you have available to you, right? It's, it's the memory bandwidth. Um, it's, it, Part of your comparison, though, is the EGX2 to 20 CPU go. So it's actually 20 times processor bandwidth, right? Just the memory bandwidth. So it's just yeah. a memory bandwidth argument, then it's a little bit. Yeah, but when you're trying to do it in the 20 CPU nodes, you've got a lot more coordination going on between the different nodes. This is a single computer. And so you get to. You have, right, you've got interconnects in between your GPUs. So your GPUs don't have to go over PCIe, right? They can speak to each other directly using NVLink. And they, they, I, that number's always changing, but I think it's like 160, 180 gigabytes per second right now. So, and not only that, but they can, you can write algorithms where they access each other's memory, right? You, you can treat the entire box as one memory space if you want to. We don't do that right now because that feels lazy, but, um, yeah, I mean these are these are these are monster machines in terms of 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 memory bandwidth and well this takes up a lot more room too, you know. That this is like that and 20 CPU nodes is well it's not. How much does this DGX2 cost? I think it's a quarter of a million dollars. It might be more. <laughs> DGX1 is probably like 100 or maybe a little bit less now. Do your customers actually go and buy is actually a little bit, yeah. Oh, shit. I shouldn't have. Um, great. Uh, we're going to bleed the next minute or so. So, a lot of people, um, yeah, nobody here wears, right? I love them. They've, and that's how he died. It is. You're welcome. How much does that power nine thing cost? <sighs> like 40, 50 grand. You can get something that's, that's, that's got like three or four GPUs in it. The, probably the GPUs are like 10,000, 11,000 bucks, right? Um, your students. And he died again. <laughs> Questions? What is your join algorithm? So merge? Um, there's two. There's a there's a sort merge join and there's a hash join. It's you, on the GPU. Yeah. How do you how do you do a hash join in the GPU? <sighs> you ask Nikolai, <laughs> who's the guy that did it. Somebody at Nvidia built the the actual the probing and the the building of the hash table. Um, the basic idea is you do it in a very stupid way and you synchronize um, after. So you 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 do something like this. Um, I've got. Uh, uh, a thousand, uh, a thousand threads, and each one is like divided up in these groups of a hundred, and they share this shared memory representation, right? So shared memory is orders of magnitude faster than global memory, and it's it's a lot cheaper to synchronize. So you write to the shared memory, you reach like this point where your shared memory is kind of like ah, this is like what I consider full, and then you bring from, and then basically your first thread in each group of your hundred threads, when it gets to this point, it. It, it, um, it, it pulls it into global memory. So you build many hash tables and then merge them is the idea. And the coalescing is done all on the GPU, not up in the CPU. All on the GPU. All on the GPU. Okay, is your hash time faster than your merge time? Um, it's appropriate. In most use cases, yes, the hash join is faster. How much? Uh, that's. Like there's a backstory to this, you probably are right, which was a yeah. with a different company that also did GPU accelerated analytics, which where they said, no, 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 we don't bother with hash joins. We can't figure out anything. So the, it, it's um, it, it was a lot harder to figure out before. Um, so you have more options for for managing that synchronization and um, one of the things that they did is that the hash map because. They, they, they didn't know how big it was going to grow or not grow at the beginning. It is done in UVM, not in, uh, not in regular. This is a point of contention amongst us. I, I love UVM, but I think that there are specific places for it. And you know, the building up of a high performance hash table may or may not be it. But that's how it's doing it now. It's, it's using UVM. Do you guys know what that is? Unified virtual memory? 
No? Unified virtual memory basically means I um, allocate some memory, and is it on the GPU? Is it on the CPU? You don't know. You don't care. If you address it, it works. So that, that's basically the idea. It's, it's coherency between the, the system memory and, and the GPU, so that you can, you can access this information on, on both without having you know, things go, oh my god, I'm on the CPU, and you're asking me for this GPU pointer, or vice versa. I said a lot of things that should be like, not, that you should be like, no way. Like I got a lot of no, like a year ago, I feel like I would have gotten a lot more no ways. Are you always just like all on the GPU bandwagon? They rock? You want to use them? You want to play around? We're still trying to figure it out. So what, what's the biggest challenge you guys face now? Like uh, business or technical? So business, um, so this Rapids ecosystem was uh, NVIDIA and a bunch of relatively small organizations. And um, Oracle, IBM, um, and all those other, like a lot of couple of fancy names have all agreed to come into this ecosystem and they said they're going to dump tons of engineers and code into it. And uh, that's a little bit scary for me, uh, especially because, you know, the, the, we've all been working on this. So there's been a high degree of control, right? There's, I know everyone that's working on this project right now, and that's about to become a lot more people. And we are not an enormous entity, so in the business, uh, where I'm, you know, I'm worried of losing the edge that we currently have because we built it. We're we're really aware of all the new stuff of how it's working. We, uh, the, our our engine comes out like a week or two behind Rapids. Um, as opposed to, you know, months behind Rapids. They're, but that, that is a real business uh, worry for us. Like our, for 14, 14, 15, sorry, 15. Uh, 14 and a part-time very smart guy. <laughs> How many in Peru? Um, 10. 10 in Peru. 10 in Peru. I meant on Rapids. How many people? Oh, in Rapids? It's like 60 engineers. 60. Yeah. It's about 60 engineers. So about 35-ish uh, from NVIDIA, then uh, 10 on our side, and then like another 10 or 15 from Anaconda, and then a few from Guns, uh, from Gun Rock and Quan Sight. And how many do you think are going to join with the big bank? <sighs> um, I have no idea. They're saying that they're going to bring in like another 100 developers and stuff like that. So who knows, like, what the is... I, oh... One, I'll, when, I, when I see it, I will believe it, and then I will freak out. Um, as of right now, I'm pretty chill. Um, technically, uh, my biggest concern is that, so we made, a, it's, it's a risk, it's a risk, it's a decision that we made, right? Uh, do you try to make these trees that you can, you know, kind of distribute, and then there's some kind of shuffling process at the very end of query execution that makes sure that you didn't miss anything? So like in... In the case of you're doing something like aggregations, right, it's really easy. Oh, okay, this is what I aggregated on, and this is my value, and I just have to kind of put them together and merge them, right? But this can be, um, gets a little bit more complicated when you're talking about things like left out or join. Um, you know, did, did this thing, was it ever like in the, like, it, oh, it, 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 it never got compared, or, you know, you, 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 have, you, you have to manage that, like, like in, in the old version of the engine, we did all that work at the end, basically, right? Where we'd, we'd divide up the data set, run the query, and then we knew how to bring that back together to get the full result set. In this case, what we've decided is that every step along the way is going to be distributed and resolved. So I am, we're banking on NICs getting better than they are today, literally getting better, um, and in, in having more throughput internode, being able to, uh, to use GPU direct so that we can bypass the kernel whenever we're trying to send information from the GPU to the network card to the other network card. Um, but that, that, I think, technically, I think that's one of our, our biggest risks. Like, is, are we going to get burned because there's going to be a lot more move? Because I, until we see it, like, we got no clue, right? Oh, is it going to be moving too much? Is it going to be too little? Like, there's... That, that, and that's, that's the, yeah, that, that's the real risk is when people start using this for real 
am I gonna be network bound and I just did all this for nothing and then we're gonna have to go and rework, but. What do you use for communication across the network? So, um, there's two things. Um, there's uh, the Open UCX project, which is being worked on. Um, so, putting UCX into the Rapids AI and right now we're using flat, uh, flat buffers on, uh, over, over TCP, Rocky, or InfiniBand. But yeah, flat buffers is what we're using for non-GPU communication. So for like the matter, like when you IPC a column over to somebody, there, yeah, sure, there's the GPU data, but you also have the size, the type, you know, like what am I, you, you have other information, which is, which is on the CPU, right? But that, that is relevant to the column. And all that goes over with flat buffers now. All right, time for one more question. I'm really sorry you had to go through that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, let's thank Felipe again. I was just clapping for myself. That felt awkward. Sorry. Uh, next week, we have Richard Hens from Bright Light. Uh, and then November 29th or something, we have the Swarm 64 guys coming. They, they do FPGAs. So, all right, guys, have a good weekend. Let's take a trip to the far side and black suits troops the group on the stalk And the uncivilized island of New York where the criminals run the project development through drug spots I be sleeping through the screens and rapid fire shots My block consists of multiple juvenile offenders and their crews I'm telling you, even free sense get dead zone These kids making fix, peep this Operation safe home and shit Giuliani got these perpetrating housing cops on the dicks Now ain't this a bitch?